yeah, the sacrifice that we we need for our elected officials uh, mirrors what the sacrifice of uh, like a parent um, and, and a single parent and a mother would give you. It's having the resources to change the lives of those that you have authority and should be shepherding along the way, even though they don't agree with you at all times. Stephen Raga, hello, and thank you so much for making time for us here on Sojanel. Thank you for making the time. I'm very excited. I've been hearing of you. I've heard your name so many times when you talk about Filipino American community or when you talk to Filipino American uh, esteemed pioneers and pillars, uh, your name always comes up. So we know you as an active supporter and a passionate advocate for the Filipino American community. But recently you threw your hat in the race for city council, a 26th district seat in New York. So what uh, pushed you to make that move? Uh, what pushed me is, uh, one, is just being connected to our community in the first place. Um, learning from the, uh, the community leaders that we have, not just in New York, but nationally, who really paved the way and uh, let us uh, try to stake our claim in, in wherever communities we are uh, to make sure we empower uh, those around us, our neighbors, our families, our friends, um, and that it's about time that somebody that looks like, like us can represent our community to a degree and um, a level that can um, uh, imp not just uh, uh, support us, but also make us proud. So I'm thinking that uh, there has been, in New York, it's different. Uh, we've never had an elected uh, Filipino full-time in an office in the city level or the state, the entire state. So um, this is something that is high time and a big, uh, the one big issue or instance that made me decide to let's do it, we have to do it is when a member of our own community, Noel Quintana, was attacked in the subway and the L train back in February. There was no real support from our elected officials uh, for, for him. In fact, uh, just this weekend, he said they might have given him $21 <laughs> in, in benefits as it. And um, you can trust me if I was in a elect, an elected official re representing New Yorkers that I'd be up in arms and, and fighting for all New Yorkers uh, as fierce as I would fight for Noel. So no Filipino, you're, you're, you're blazing, you're hoping to blaze the trail. Is there pressure? Do you feel pressure? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is pressure. Um, luckily, there's two other uh, Filipino candidates on the city, city council level that are, that are um, running at the same time. Um, Marnie Halasa in, in Manhattan and Deirdre Levy in, uh, in Brooklyn. So luckily, uh, we're making history together. It's the first time three uh, Filipino candidates are on the ballot at the same time in New York City. And I um, mean, it's an exciting time, especially in a time where uh, we need the representation the most. And um, is there pressure? Yes, there, uh, there is. But unfortunately, we're, uh, uh, we're used to that type of uh, pressure on our shoulders um, from uh, working with the community. And um, what, what would be more stressful is that if we didn't even try and attempt this and go in another election cycle where we have nobody uh, shouting on the rooftop about issues that would be pertaining to us and protect our community. Right. And this is the first time you're running, but you're not a newbie when it comes to public service because you have been working under public servants. Have you always loved public service? Have you always loved activism? And who and what or who or what led you to this? Yeah, sure. Have I always? No way. It didn't sound, it wasn't, it didn't sound like fun. <laughs> so I think, um, especially, uh, in, in terms of activism, um, it really in started after or during end of college because I was the president of the Filipino organization at Stony Brook um, and then um, out, out in New York and also the national chairperson for FIND, the Filipino Intercollegiate Networking Dialogue. So it's the, um, I think it's, I don't know how national it is now, but um, it, it, it was, you know, interstate and, and making sure all our uh, younger Filipino American leaders were, uh, were working together uh, talking about community um, per, uh, issues pertaining to them and also culture and, and, and giving them an early start to that in, in college. Um, after that, I started uh, interning um, in the Filipino community. Um, at the same time, I was both uh, 
at uh, Philippine Forum in Queens and more social advocacy organization and also at the Philippine consulate um, at the same time. So um, very international in scope and, and looking for, for ways to help the Filipino community, um, not just in the Philippines, but abroad um, at the consulate. And then also afterwards, I would be at the Philippine Forum or trying to fight for the rights of, of our Filipino uh, community here in, in, in New York, especially immigrant youth at the time. Um, I think what started it all um, was also at the time at the Philippine Forum and was the, the emergence of a specific bill uh, back in 2005 and 2006, the Sensenbrenner Bill, HR 4437, which uh, um, definitely were, was uh, disproportionately uh, attacking um, immigrant communities in, in New York and even those that uh, worked with uh, immigrant communities. So that's kind of what uh, to a degree politicized or at least made me more interested in, in, in activism. And, but that goes, but that's separate from public service. Cause that made me those years working in, in the community. You're not very, um, you know, feel trustworthy with politicians cause they're kind of the problem of why a lot of these things are, are coming to play. Um, how I ended up anyway in uh, working as a staffer um, for elected official is because I was with a an, an advocacy organization um, a few years back in which we were putting together uh, the Defend Little Manila coalition here in Woodside in, in Queens, where there was a structure that was that was trying to um, up up zone. So get a high, have the ability to increase their um, the the space and the floor the floor ratio that they, to air ratio they would have and also how how high they could build, and that would but that would negatively impact all the Filipino small businesses in in the, in, in the vicinity, it's putting up the rent, putting up the property taxes, and during the time of building would also uh, take away parking spaces and make construction unnecessarily uh, um, uh, just around for for any of the, the you know customers. During that time, not long story short, during that time, um, a, uh, one of the elected the politicians or the candidates that were running used to go to our meetings. And uh, at first, the first two times, you're like, look at this guy, he's just trying to, you know, look at these politicians, they're just trying to get our vote and uh, go to our meetings. And after the third or fourth time, you're like, well, I think he knows that most of us aren't voting in a primary. <laughs> That's not what we're doing. And, and yeah, I think he really just cares. So. Um, uh, so that's how afterwards, after he won his election, I became his chief of staff and I was doing that for four years. So at the same time, I joined the community board. I was also, um, uh, on the state, um, uh, the state, which is like a, a town council in, in New York and also on the, the state committee for the U S commission on, on civil rights, where I was appointed, uh, right before, uh, on, on the last year of, uh, president Obama's term. So, yeah, so multi-levels there, um, on different degrees of responsibility, but, Unfortunately, I find it fun. So that is my curse now. I wish I found it boring and I could, you know, uh, work and, you know, work for the Knicks or something. But I, actually, public service is uh, uh, something I, I feel uh, more inclined and, and, uh, and responsible to stay in. Right. But you mentioned something, though. Uh, there is, I was born and raised in the Philippines, and you know, politics in the Philippines is, is dirty. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. what they say. Yeah. Uh, it is. Um, and so there's this concept of a dirty pot whoever holds this even if you hold it with clean hands when you're done with it or when you're in it you can't help but dirty your hands right yeah this is what you also mentioned earlier politics is not always like yeah, politicians we can't always trust them and all that yeah what do you say to people now how can we trust or have faith that you're going to be different yeah yeah i mean i uh, I mean, I'll hold a dirty pot as long as possible, and I will make sure. That I, I I don't know how the the saying goes in 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 the Philippines, but um, I, I I will say it's it, it if we're gonna look at like a track record in which um, we we make sure that we hold uh, politicians or other stakeholders that negatively impact the community accountable. I kind of have that, you know, I, I don't want to, it looks like <laughs> I have that track record. Um, and, and so that even though that, that pot, pot might be dirtying my hands, um, I'll make every uh, um, uh, opportunity to lift it up and show you how clean it still, <laughs> it still is and be transparent. And if it's, if it's the same color as the pot, like I'll, I will resign in front of you guys. I'd rather keep a, <laughs> rather keep a clean slate and a, and a clean soul. 
I love that. Clean slate, clean soul. You have, um, and, and I've heard a lot about your integrity as well, credibility within the American community. And people know that about you, right? But not too many people know that you were actually raised by a single mom. How does that factor in, in the man that you've become now? Like, you know, a service oriented, heart for the people and clean, credible, living life with integrity. Yeah, sure. I, I, it's, uh, you trying to make me cry? What do you, what do you do? <laughs> oh so, no. I <laughs> it, you know, it actually has it, it direct um uh you could have there's a d direct uh you could attribute it directly to being raised by by a single mom i mean it, the way it happened was also so sudden uh because it was really weird because i was born here but since my dad did not have his um you know the uh, the green card or citizen yet uh, my mom stayed here while i was sent back to the Philippines um, after I was being born in after being born in New York City, so I lived I grew up in the Philippines for for a year for a few years and came back when my dad had you know was allowed to come back in. I had to go through like ESL and learn English and and and, and do all that. Um, and a few years later, uh, that's when my dad passed away uh, suddenly. Um, and and so my you know out of nowhere, my mom had to figure out you know what the, uh, what to do and uh, how to help and. Um, and, and, you know, picking up the pieces. And bef a month before my dad died, her dad died. So it was like back to back, um, January, then February. She was very, uh, um, I still remember, very uh, uh, affected by it. Um, but anyway. How old were you? Seven. seven. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but, but, e but either way, uh, it was, uh, so for the next, you know, few years, uh, um, and at the time, I didn't really think much of it. Like looking back, well, anything parents do, you don't think about it in the, <laughs> in, in, in the moment. You have to look back years afterwards. And uh, it's when my mom was like, you know, she went to work. And then um, actually, let me let me bring it back. Uh, in order to get to where I would be going to school, we had to wake up at, at 4, 10 a.m. every day. So she'd wake me up at 4, 10 a.m. We get on a bus at like 4, 30 a.m. Go over where she dropped me off and um, at 5 30 a.m just so she could go back on the bus the other way get on the train in queen go all the way into the city in time for her work um so she could do that in the in the evening i meet her at home and then she'd go to another job her second job then on the weekend would be the third job uh she would be going to uh just to make sure we have you know money for uh, uh money for rent the utilities for food sometimes she made too much food uh but um a lot of that was uh because she you know she really wanted to uh, at least let me know that uh, we were taken care of, and um, she was going to take care of uh, take care of whatever necessities we uh, we needed. So, I mean, that's something she just did every day, and um, that kind of service to family um, mm -hmm. is something uh, she took with her even after she retired, because she was also still very community oriented. Here in Woodside, um, I saw uh, two particular times where and you can stop me at any time because i'm just going no no around. go ahead go ahead it's, uh, um i think there's there's a lot of volunteers here in the community that do a lot uh you know cleaning up the trash you know not getting paid for it, just making sure that there's you know um cleaning up the bushes the the, the trees making you know re sowing the dirt i didn't know this until later on because i met some of the people over there and me and my mom went to like a filipino restaurant and afterwards i was like i, I saw the guys who regularly volunteer i'm going and the people in charge are like, oh, hey, what's up? Hey, Dave. Hey, I'm, what's going on? Hey, do you know my mom? And then they're like, hey, yeah, I know. How do you know her? I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? It's like, oh, she buys us coffee and food all the time whenever we're going over here. Like, she's a longtime supporter of us. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? This is my mom. She's not <laughs> doing anything here. So there's always times where, you know, I'd see her supporting the community, not asking for um, anything in return. And it's, uh, you know, just to connect those dots where, uh, were really good. I, there was another time. I don't know why all our stories start with uh, after we ate Filipino food. But then when she was going home, she had she had a, a bunch of food for the week. And then I kind of went back and she went her own way. And I said, oh, I'll follow her back to walk her back to her apartment. And I saw her give all that food to uh, to homeless people that were in that were in a park. So, uh, yeah, that kind of a dedication to uh, uh, to community, but also uh, not asking for anything in return, you know, just doing what you can under the radar, 
uh, that's something um, I, I, you know, held with me and something I, I learned from her. And um, I know like something running for office is not under the radar, um, but it's uh, truly what helps, uh, you know, steam uh, this campaign that we're doing. I love this story of how she not only raised you, are you an only child? Were you an only child? Yeah, yeah. My mom and my, my dad, they got it right the first time. I'm the only child. <laughs> right. So um, I love how she raised you by herself, but at the same time found time and purpose to take care of the community as well. Um, not having a father figure, um, science, um, you know, there's many studies about this, not having a father figure growing up. Um, it affects uh, the social and emotional development of children. But, but um, you have run into an empathic um, man, uh, like I said earlier, you know, hard for service and all that. What do you think um, did your mom do right? What's so special about the, the way your mom raised you? I mean, she's al always supportive, um, never, uh, never really uh, uh, negative on, on any of my, uh, uh, I guess, uh, any of the projects I wanted to, to, to go on or or, or pursue. Uh, she always said whatever I want to do. I asked her multiple times, are you sure you don't want me to major in nursing? I'll do it. Are you <laughs> sure? And she said, oh, whatever. No, whatever makes you happy. Like, are you sure? You know how much they're making? They got jobs right now. There's a recession. Are you like, no, whatever you want. Um, so she just wanted me to be the best in whatever I, you know, put my heart into. So um, I don't know if that's what makes her uh, unique. I'm sure other parents do that, but it definitely is a, a, a big factor. Because you could have gone the other way as well. There's so many, uh, and, and, and you would have had an excuse to have gone the other way. What is the other way? Wait, wait. You have gone the, the, the other path, like where you're maybe getting in trouble with the law or, you know, oh. being rebelling or having yeah. a different life, making, making yeah. wrong choices, right? Yeah. Yeah, and also it, it's funny. I don't even think I, I got to think back <laughs> then, but definitely I have a lot of, uh, you know, a circle of friends. Um, it's not just in New York, but you know, it was across, you know, in, in, in the nineties, it was very different than what it is, is now. Um, and a lot of my circle of friends got, got in trouble with the law or, or had to, you know, were in jail or had to, um, you know, didn't want to go to school or, or, or flunked out of school. Um, and these were, you know, they were all races, but also a lot of Filipinos, um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know what it is. I, I guess I just had, you know, more positive uh, uh, circle of friends also to, to make sure that we did go to school uh, most times or, or, or stay out of trouble too much and, or too much trouble and, and keep us on the right, on the right path. But, um, yeah, I think that, that, I think that would, that instance is more than, than um, my mom herself, but making sure that, uh, even though she was single, a single parent, that she was making sure I was in touch with good influences from our family in general, maybe cousins, aunts, uncles, and friends around the neighborhood that she knew were a good influence. So um, it was really uh, a lot of folks helping me, uh, helping me grow. And also there's a lot of um, kind of like life advice or parenting hacks that we can get from your experience. Like that, you know, even as a single mom, like um, surrounding you with other positive influences. But what would you advise other single moms out there who are struggling with raising their children? Yeah, I, I don't know because I don't want to put myself in there. <laughs> I'm sure there's other, you know, things I, I don't want to give a general piece of advice. Um, I would say what worked for me is just always being, being supportive, um, even how annoying or, or sarcastic you're <laughs> Your, your, uh, uh, your, your children, your American children might be, um, but always finding time to, to go ahead and, and help them pursue what uh, their interests. Um, I think I mentioned before also the, uh, um, you know, my mom would have, her whole day is traveling across New York City, just dropping me off, going to work. And I mean, she'd still find time afterwards. I, you just made me remember this now is that it would be, uh, 30 minutes before the library would close and we'd find time to go to the library, right? And she's like, she, she treated like the playground, right? I was like, oh, go, go here, read books. And I'm like, what? This is, oh, <laughs> oh okay, I will. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yeah, just constant, constant uh, uh, love that you give. I'm, they might not see it now, but 
um, which my mom told me she was right. I'm kind of annoyed she was right, is that uh, you'll notice it when they're gone. And your mom has passed. She lived a, a, a full life and now you're remembering her. Uh, what would be your message to her? Uh, she was right in most of the things I told her she was wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, that a lot of the, uh, the, the effort and the sacrifice that she did on a daily basis over the years um, uh, hopefully has paid off. Hopefully I'm uh, someone that she thought would, uh, uh, would, would, is the fruit that, would, you know, that is bearing because of her, her sacrifice and uh, growing up to be somebody that uh, she could be uh, proud of and say that she helped uh, uh, put that uh, together, whether I thought it was the best or not. But um, hopefully I'm living uh, the life that she thought I, I should I think she is. I think she thinks that. You mentioned about effort and sacrifice. That's also what we demand of our public service. Mm. So what would be your plan and your vision for the city? I, I like how you brought it back. That's good. I like how... <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not an amateur. <laughs> I, know, I know. I know. So it's, um, it's the same sa uh, sacrifice and commitment uh, to those that you oversee that uh, that I learned from from my mom, so I think that's something I can I can bring to the table. The name of the game is sacrifice. That when you're you're helping the community, involving the community is sacrifice, and and also having the background knowledge of what that sacrifice looked like in an elected office, being chief of staff in the same neighborhoods uh, as where I'm running for city council for. I kind of know what I'd be walking into, and I kind of know that it's. Uh, like, you, like, like we're saying, is uh, we're going to have to give a lot of opportunities that give up for ourselves, some peace of mind, some, some peace, and some, some self-care time would be out of the question. And we'd have to give it to those in our community that need it more than us. Right. Thank you so much. We'll end um, on that note. And we hope to have you back on the show congratulating you. No, thanks. I would love that. Um, uh, uh, and hopefully after, after the election in June, I'd love to come back. Or we can start our series on on you know on Clubhouse, and then we can uh, we could have that too. So whatever uh, whatever uh, uh, you would like to do, there's a lot of options here. Right. Thanks so much, Steve, and God bless you on your journey. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Great great to be here today, and uh, um, uh, thanks for your time, Jill.